Good evening, friends. I'm Michael Gary, head of school at Friends Select. And I wanna welcome all of you to our webinar titled Fertile Ground, Art, Community, and the Urban Oasis. We're hoping for a vigorous and interesting discussion about the nature of art and community in our Philadelphia area. To get us started, here is our host for this evening, Chris Singler, director of the upper school here at Friends Select. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. My, I'm the host and Conrad Benner is the moderator this evening. Hello. Which I don't know if we've made a firm distinction between the host and moderator. So we're just gonna get through this together here. Uh, welcome to Friends Select and what we hope is an engaging evening for you here. Uh, again, my name's Chris Singler, I'm the upper school director. I am one of the, the only person actually on uh, this evening who's not an artist, uh, was an English major, an English teacher for many, many years, but I care deeply about art, art making, the potential for art to transform communities and help name things that are unnameable in other media and other formats. Being, so, being a leader is its own kind of art form. That's so right. There you go. That's You're right. Artist, you got to do this dance all the yeah, time. Right. So uh, before I say a few words about this evening, thank you to Pam McCabe and to Jacob Todd, who helped put all of this together and are here in the room guiding us uh, through this. So in the context of 2022, with global political tensions blossoming all around us, with pandemics that won't seem to fully go away, and racial reckonings happening, why does art matter? What can art making teach us about each other, about ourselves and the world that our news feeds and social media streams can't or won't access? What energetically and spiritually is happening to the world? And what can we learn by stopping and talking with working artists. That's what I'm really interested in. I wanna hear from, from our guests tonight about that. Implicit in this panel is, is the conception that Philadelphia is a particularly robust and productive place to make art and that it's a refuge of sorts. Cities around the globe have often been known to be artistic centers. And our main curiosity in gathering these four artists and one critic and blogger together is to consider how Philadelphia inspires artists to make art. What about our Philadelphia neighborhoods encourage or resist collaboration? And how do identity and community get celebrated through art making in an urban space? So I'm really excited about tonight. Conrad, before I introduce the artists, anything you wanna to add to that? No, I think, you know, this will be a really fun conversation. I think whenever you get this many creatives in a room together, um, you know, our job is to think about and reflect the world around us. And I think that's what we're doing tonight. Awesome, awesome. So I wanna briefly uh, introduce the four uh, artists and then have Conrad introduce himself. Um, after that, each of the artists is going to show you some of their slides of their artwork and talk through what they're trying to achieve and, and do with their artwork. And after that, we will have a conversation. Feel free to use the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask any questions and we'll try to get to those. I'm also gonna to try to represent a lot of the questions that students who spoke with us about the different works of art here uh, and the artists here uh, brought to us as well. And type your questions as the presentations are happening, you know, as yep. they're fresh in your mind, because we can get, them at the, get to them at the end. Yep, you know? yep, don't wait. So Chen Lin Chai, was born in Fujian, China, and has been engaged in mural creation since 2005. He has installed dozens of murals in the United States and China, such as Shuchang City Museum, Korean Cultural Center in Beijing, First Street Green Culture Park in New York, and 10th Street Plaza in Philadelphia's Chinatown. Since 2018, his mural story was reported several times by the Philadelphia Inquirer. Chai is also a multidisciplinary visual artist in his works, he combines traditional Chinese ink painting with contemporary art expressions to create a unique visual image that fuses art and science. His works have been exhibited in the United Nations, 2021 New York Art Expo, 12th Florence Biennial, and Freeman's Auction Gallery. Welcome, Chen Lin. Just the Thank United you. Nations. Just, Just the United, United Nations. Nations. Wow. A little place. <laughs> so cool. none, of, none of us are part of it. 
Uh, Mikhail Elam is a figurative visual artist most known for painting and drawing using mixed mediums of oil, acrylic, collage, paint, markers, resins, and found materials. His work's reoccurring objective is to heighten the presence of African-American imagery in a not so accepting world. He identifies with the Afrofuturism movement as a vision for the future of ethnicity in society. Mikhail has shown both nationally and internationally. He's currently a Mural Arts 2021 Cohorts Fellow and is also a current artist in residence at the Fittler Club in Philadelphia. He currently has a solo exhibition at Rutgers Camden SWG Art Gallery. Welcome, Mikhail. Lori Wasselchuk is a visual storyteller whose work is a simultaneous inquiry into the lived experiences, poetic bodies of humans and the systems they inhabit, contest, and construct. Wasselchuk works collaboratively, drawing from many disciplines and resources to create experiences that describe and convene community. Wasselchuk is a recipient of numerous honors, including the Leeway Foundation's Transformation Award, a Pew Fellowship for the Arts, the Aaron Siskin Foundation's Individual Photographer Fellowship, and the Southern African Gender and Media Award. Welcome, Lori. And Ron Washington. Ron L. Washington was born in Philadelphia. He attended the Fine Arts Magnet Program at Overbrook High School. Ron received his BFA from the University of the Arts and received a Leonard Andrews Foundation Painting Award, which allowed him to attend the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts for an additional year of study. He has exhibited at numerous venues, including Dizziner's Gallery, Sandy Webster Gallery, as well as the Balsh Institute, the Free Library of Philadelphia, Villanova University, and the African American Museum in Dallas, Texas. He has won numerous awards and grants and had his work published in the book, Mothers, A Loving Celebration, published by Courage Books, as well as the International Review of African American Art. Ron's work is currently on view here at Friend Select, just down the hallway in the Select Gallery at Friend Select School. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, stop by and Pam will see if she can give you a tour of his work. Welcome, Ron. And I'm really excited for Conrad to uh, introduce himself. Yeah, Ron, I just saw, I, I did a bathroom check before I came, uh, you know, started the night and I just saw the artwork, it's so good. I can't wait to talk with you. And I hope you have a million murals by the time, you know, this year's over, but. <laughs> so my name is Conrad Benner. Um, in 2011, I started a blog called Streets Department and it highlights and celebrates art in the public space. Um, we explore commissioned and non-commissioned art. So street art and muralism. Uh, graffiti, public art, monuments, everything in between. And I'll talk a bit more about that tonight, those distinctions and sort of mm. what is the role, you know, the big question of the blog is sort of what is the role of art in our public space? What do we want from it and what's going on with it? Um, more recently, uh, the blog has been successful enough to where I've had partnerships with WHYY exploring public space more broadly. Um, and that's what I do uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I'm a podcaster, blogger, and your co-host tonight, or co-moderator. Co-moderator, like co-host and moderator. Titles, titles, titles don't matter. Yes, yes. Um, but we're excited to start tonight with um, Chaylin. So Chaylin, if you want to turn your camera on, uh, again, we're going to have little presentations from each of the artists tonight. And then at the end, uh, we'll all five come together and we'll talk like we're at a restaurant and really explore uh, this work a little bit more. So Chaylin, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah. You know my name. My name is Chenin Tsai, and I'm have so honored to be invited to present my work in this you know panel discuss uh, discussion. So now let me share my screen. And... Okay, so make sure everyone can see my screen, right? Okay. So, yeah, uh, Chen okay, Lin, yeah. You have your, your screen showing great. You're good. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, so today I wanted to talk about some of my, you know, public mural project in mostly in Philly and in China. And this is the, my, the same, yep, the public art for the community. Okay, let's, let's meet the painting the mural on the street. So here, let me simply introduce my background. I graduate from the Tsinghua University 2010 for my first master MFA degree. And then I studied here in Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts for my second master degree and graduate. 
in uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2017. So before I came here, I already uh, was a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a mural artist and did a lot of mural projects in China. So here in the very beginning of my presentation, I show some of my mural projects in China. I start my mural pro uh, project practice from 2006. And then my first big mural project is for the Sui Chang Citizens Museum. It works with my you know, friends, I'm, but I'm the main chief uh, designer and uh, mural designer for this team. And you can see these are some of my murals in you know, Sui Chang City Museum. And we have the big studios and my assistants. And this is the second mural, okay, kind of uh, another mural project for the Korean Culture Center of the South Korean Embassy. And then that year is 2008. And then yes, Beijing is holding the Beijing Olympic Games. So as a, you know, a, a theme, they, the, the embassy just suggests me to design a mural to connect the Beijing and you know, so, uh, Seoul. So I designed this mural to show the friendship, you know, you know, connection between two cities and two you know, countries and through the Olympic you know, spirit. And uh, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, okay, here. So this is another you know, mural project I did for the Korean Culture Center. And this is about the you know, traditional opera you know, culture. And now let me show my footprint in Philadelphia. So 2014, I you know, came to you know, Philadelphia for, you know, my study. The reason I the reason why I decided to study second master degree because when I was 30, 2014, uh, 2014, I I decided to explore my career in another country for my next step. So I decided to come to United States. And I I think that it's good for me to study and settle down for two years to you know familiar with the culture, the environment. Of United States, especially in Philadelphia. When I first came to Philadelphia, this city is amazing, surprised me. And Philadelphia is famous by murals. Philly had more than, I think it's more than 2,000, even more murals in the whole great, greater Philadelphia region. And I realized that is not much murals to tell about Asian community or Asian cultures. As long as I know, it's roughly like, a, you know, 15 or 16. So I decide, because I, I know I'm, I can make Miro, but here, when I first came here, I'm nobody. So I should use my strategy to let people know I'm the Miro artist, I can do something for them. And especially if I want to tell the story of, for them, you know, Miro arts, especially public arts could, could be a good, you know, master and platform. So here, when I came here, and then I make several murals in firstly from the you know, Chinatown area, and make the mural, small mural for the you know, restaurant, some of the business for the interior mural. And then stuff from that, people get to know about me more. So 2018, the Philadelphia Inquiry, the journalist Juliana, you know, make, a, you know, make an interview from, you know, with me about my mural story. And this is the beginning of my murals, painting murals for the food truck in Temple University. But since I came here, I, really decide I wanted to use Miro to tell a story for the community, for the people you know, I represent. So I want to do more murals for the you know, Asians. So that's the reason why most of the murals you can see is an Asian, uh, Asian cultural theme. Because I think Philly has, has already have a lot of murals, but Asian mural, Asian cultural mural is not that much. So it's my responsibility to do more to let people know about you know, our cultures. And uh, the second mural, the, another mural I want to show is here is the uh, dragon boating mural you know, for the restaurant in Philadelphia, Chinatown. And you know, in, in China, and especially in Asian, you know, uh, East Asian, like Japan, uh, South Korean, and then Southeast Asian, you know, dragon boating is a very, popular you know, activity and people use this to you know, pray for good fortune and especially to show our spirit and you know, we keep fighting for the better life. So when I designed this mural for the restaurant, I know that owner is the captain. He's the captain of the Dragon Boat team. 
of Chinatown. And Chinatown Dragon Ball team won the championship for several years. So I think it's good for me to use their story to make a customized mirror for me. So I decided to use the, their picture, right? Of the, when they're the dragon boating the, the dragon boat and then transform into the you know black and white style, like an ink painting style. And it depict the, the, the moment, how they fight, you know, and working together to go forward. And then the second mural project I want to show you is um, for the Papa restaurant in the old city, Philadelphia. And that time I want to show, because this restaurant, they have a, you know, they selling the Sichuan hot pot is a spicy, you know, you know, food and famous in China and also quite popular in here. People wanted to taste them, the spicy food and especially very unique. So I decided to use the red color and then panda as the, you know, main character to make it. But most of these murals might more like, you know, make it relaxed and fun. And then next that I start to make a mural for the, Japanese restaurant. And then this time I really used the Asian, you know, cultural elements a lot in this design. You can see that uh, it's a Japanese you know, restaurant, mostly they sell sushi something. So I think if I want to tell a story, so I need to find a symbol to represent like uh, Asian culture. Or, so I find the Taiji. And then I don't want to show my mirror just about Asian culture. I also wanted to show something about the, the, the relationship between Asian, you know, Eastern and Western. So I find the infinity symbol here to combine with the Taiji symbol, mostly they represent the you know, you know, East uh, Asian symbols. So I put these two in one. So the white side is the salmon fish and water. The right side, the, the black side is a black ink and a swore fish. So one is represent East, another represent West. So as long as I did continue this project more, and then I was invited to make a mural project for the first green cultural park, first street green cultural park. So I continue to develop this idea to paint this mural in here. In here. And then I was invited to, invite to design the mural, uh, the, another mural project for them. So this is for the wasteland. So this is 2018. So I make my uh, uh, mushroom cloud explosion on top of this uh, mirror and write all the background. You can, on the, in the background, you can see all the words, right? So this mirror project is kind of half made by me, half made by the, you know, the viewers. I invite the viewers, all the people just work by and then let them just write down some of the news they can search from the internet about our war. So at that time, Trump is still, you know, was the president and people, um, okay, I know just it's very complicated. So people, some people are worried about the future of our world. So some people really choose a lot of, you know, negative, you know, news from that. And then I asked them to use the marker to write on top. And after, because this is the exterior mirror. So after, you know, couple months, all the world that write, because different people from different background, they write like Chinese, Koreanese, and then English, all this, you know, Spanish, you know, Okay, here. So here, let me show you something more. Okay, so this is some of the mural project I I done for the Vietnamese restaurant, and then let me go to the Philadelphia mural project I do. So this is a, some of the mural project for the Philadelphia Chinatown, and then at this time, they invited me to design some mural to promote the vaccination campaign. So I designed these murals for this. You know, location and then I showed a girl the wearing the flower you know, mask. So the idea to design this you know, mural is kind of the idea is you know, if you get vaccinated, you can protect you know, your community, your family. So the more you get vaccinated, the more you know, protection, you can protect your, your friends. So the future, I, would, you know, I choose a younger girl to represent the future of the younger generation. So anything surround their face, so you no know, real facial mask it should be a flower mask. So these are some of the participants and then in this project, we have the almost 60 you know, volunteer in this mural project. And then I do some you know, mural design, uh, thank you, the mural design for the you know, vaccination campaign. So that this kind of poster to you know, use the Philly, you know, sport mascot. And then I also do some you know, uh, illustration for the real part as a you know, used art guidebook. 
to for the family to you know to play with their kids, their trials. So this kind of. So I I don't limit my art in certain kind of you know material. I try to broaden my art in different materials in different methods to achieve the goal I want to promote. You no, know, the you know, every single art public art should represent the community, the people behind you know, behind. So here are some of the news about my mural project. And another mural project I want to show you is for the 10th Street Plaza mural project in Philadelphia, Chinatown, 2019. In, in the past, this plaza is just empty. And then, you know, Philadelphia, Chinatown was cut you know, into two parts by the uh, vine, uh, high, uh, uh, highway. So they, Chinatown wanted me to design a mural as a beautiful connection to make people realize, okay, the north part of China, uh, North Park is still belong to Chinatown. So I create this kind of koi fish you know, swim in the pond as a connect bridge. And this mural project, we also invite the community to participate. And two years later, the last year, they have another uh, project asked me to expand the mural because uh, two years ago, I just paint half the plaza. And then we expand this mural to be bigger and invite more, uh, almost more than a hundred volunteer to paint the mural and kid and then you know we have the part volunteer participant from the 76 years old grandma to five years old you know you know grandsons so it's really really you know a community project i'm really happy to see people enjoy the painting mural especially this mural is after the pandemic or after the quarantine people have a, the first time can go out and then re they really enjoy the murals you know, can, can connect them together and also I threw these murals to let more people know Chinatown is gradually making a change and by this kind of public mural projects. And uh, here, and, and also I wanted to say, I don't leave in my mural just for Chinatown, for Chinese, American, uh, American Chinese, also for the other Asian people. So I do the, the mural projects for the South, you know, South Philly area for the Southeast Asian community. So also paint the mirrors for them and paint the mirror for the street, design a mirror for the chest can to deck to beautiful and beautify and decor, decorate the community, the environment. And also this is my new mural project for Philly Chinatown for 150 years anniversary. Then while painting the whole exterior wall, you can see from the six to 20 floor. So the new mirror is 50 floors high and then it could be a new Denmark for, you know, Philly Chinatown region. So we are working on this mural now. And the very last, uh, last I wanted to say mural or arts can be very serious, can be very concerned, but sometimes art can be easy and fun. So this is the one of my mural, the inferior, that people just let me to paint anything I want. So I make it just fun. The bottom is my design, the top is on the mural. I just make it everything just really fun, enjoy. And then my next footprint, I wanna say to be continued. So thank you for your watching. Chen Lin, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a real treat seeing that. And uh, when <laughs> we get to the much. discussion portion of the evening, I know Conrad and I have I some questions. Took so many notes. I'm so, so many excited notes. for that new big mural you're working on. We'll have to talk more about it, but yeah. Amazing. Um, so cool. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who don't know Chen Lin's work, his mural work is just part of what he does. He does a lot of other things as well. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to uh, Mikhail Elam. Uh, Mikhail, I think we're getting your slides and stuff set on this side. There he is. Hi, Mikhail. And Jacob's going to get your slideshow up. So as you can see with Chaylin's 10th Street mural, like the painted a, a kind of a river scene. And then what was it last year? The 76 flooded. And right. that almost became a reality. Yeah, that's right. You're predicting the future, Chaylin. That's right. Chaylin. Uh, Mikhail, no, are, you, are you good? I'm good, yes. All right, okay, perfect. Um, so this image uh, is from a current show that's at the, um, um, Rutgers Camden uh, Gallery, the SWG Gallery. 
uh, this particular show uh, is really geared towards the students and, you know, of course, adults, but the art students that go there. Um, I'm uh, I, a good friend and director of the gallery and also a teacher at the school wanted me to bring my images there to have a discussion about what I'm doing. And uh, so this was chose as the sort of opening image in the show. Uh, it's called In Bahia, which is a reference to a place in Brazil uh, where African slaves were brought and uh, of course uh, they evolved. And uh, now it's like this really kind of special place. I visited there once. Um, so I chose this image. It's a mixed media image. It's based, uh, okay, so what I do is I, I am a painter, but then what I do sometimes is deconstruct my paintings. And what that means is I possibly cut out parts of them and then I reconstruct them. And so this particular painting is originally was started out on canvas. Uh, it's now mounted on a wood panel, but before it was mount, before the figure part was mounted on a wood panel, all of the background work was uh, painted in. And then the top um, parts are the flowers, which are a collage. And actually I think uh, there's also canvas uh, sort of swirly things going on within it as well. And um, I have an, a, a big interest in the Afrofuturism movement. Um, so a lot of this came out, a lot of my interest first came from reading and, and listening to music. And, um, and, it, and, and originally the Afrofuturism idea is about moving into the future as it sort of somewhat says, and it's about diversity and cultures mixing. Um, but as you'll see in some of my work, uh, I also have to delve back into the past because in order to find myself, I'm a very future oriented person, but in order to find myself, I needed to discover my ancestry, uh, which I think a lot of it was lost in the, you know, in the sort of um, middle passage. Um, and then, you know, the great migration, there, there's just so much that's unsettling about the history of the country that in lost, sort of lost language and lost ideas. So I wanted to sort of go backwards to actually move forwards. Uh, next image please. Thank you. Um, so this is called The Outsider. Um, this image actually is, uh, lately it's been getting a lot of, um, of um, interest in the film industry. I actually have this contract with the company that um, they rent out the image uh, to, for film footage. It's usually mostly things like um, television and uh, a few feature films, but this image seems to get more, um, you know, they have a lot of my images, or at least I would say about 20. And, uh, and this one seems to get repeatedly called for. Um, it's based on this idea. It's a, you know, a little bit of my image, I would say as a painter, a lot of my work, whether it's uh, my gender or not, it's still me. It's a part of me. It's some of my thoughts and some of my reflections. Um, I generally don't paint from um, live people anymore, real people. I did at one point. Um, I'm more interested in actually finding a photograph and then um, making uh, the photograph into something else or taking part of the photograph because the photograph might speak to me but then I'll add like all of these other elements. So this is also a collage. It's uh, the mostly paint, but the actual figure is on canvas, which was cut out of another from another canvas and then mounted into this other um, image, which is of a, like a city street in New York City, basically. That's where the image came from, whether you recognize it or not. 
And it's the thought of like, um, which is uh, the personal part is, I lived in New York for a while and I really loved New York, uh, but it was this idea that in a way I was there, but I was invisible at the same time. Uh, next image. So uh, this is an image also taken from another photograph um, and it's called Flames. And uh, it's really a little bit um, based on um, some of the different people that I've met, unfortunate, like um, you know, their lives were ended sh short. Um, their lives were ended very quickly or abruptly by some sort of like, you know, strange thing. And, and the reason why I'm saying strange is because that's what it feels like to me when I hear about someone being pulled over and it should have rightly at most been given a ticket and then they somehow end up, you know, not surviving it. So uh, this image is in a homage of that. Um, a lot of this, you know, started with me. I, I'm very optimistic, but I think I had this realization about 10 years ago, around the time of the Trayvon Martin incident, that any, you know, doesn't matter what degrees you have, it doesn't matter like what, what places you've been or how much money you have, but if you're wearing a hoodie possibly or something that's suspicious, well, it might not, it might not end so well. Uh, next image. This is more of the place that I would like to see my, I, you know, I have a practice, I meditate twice a day. Um, it's helped me tremendously. And so um, a part of my ideas about Afrofuturism is that this will be a commonplace thing for most people, that they're, that aggression and all of these other things, you know, emotional unrest will just sort of calm down. And I think that we're in a world now that is moving so quickly, but it's also sort of very, very disconcerting because people are multitasking and they're, they're just jumping from one thing to another without actually really actually absorbing what life is. Uh, this piece is called um, Standing on the Shoulder of Giants, um, but it is a meditative piece and it's a reflective piece of, you know, a re reflective art piece of uh, where I think we should all be going and moving towards. Uh, next image, please. This is called the Middle Passage. Um, it's pretty much about the image of, um, you know, it's pretty much about the image of, of bodies being uh, brought across the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, um, you know, it's, it, and it's, it speaks of ancestry, the images in the background, it's all collaged together. Uh, it's a painting within a painting in a sense. Um, okay, uh, next image, please. This is based on my ancestry. I, my mother and my father, you know, are, my mother passed away just a few years ago, but there was a book. She was from uh, Henderson, North Carolina. My mother is of Haitian um, descent, and, but she grew up on a farm in Henderson and, it, and the, the county was called Vance County. And my family is listed in this book. And there were all of these great images of ancestors. And this is someone that I don't actually know. I'm not clear on how they're related to me, but they're listed in my section of the book or in our section of the book. And I just found it a compelling image. And I entitled it, uh, basically, uh, the title is uh, Someone Finally Noticed Me. Uh, next image, please. <laughs> This is just a fun image. It's, a, it's an image, it's a memory of being in New York, living in New York City, in Brooklyn, uh, at a party with a bunch of friends. And uh, it sort of represents my youth, um, you know, art and 
having fun and, uh, you know, being happy. Uh, next image. <laughs> this is another of the Mbahiha pieces. Uh, I think it's called Mbahiha 2. And it's in relationship to that very first image uh, that's at the, um, it's also in the same show. And they're, they, they just speak to each other. The two speak to each other. They, there is a dialogue between them. Uh, next image. Uh, this is called Tribe. Tribe is a painting that um, I recently did in this last year. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's a similar idea. It's about, you know, uh, people of color sort of moving together in the streets and how they how they will be perceived. Will they be perceived as, you know, accepted or will they be perceived as like, let's stay away, they're dangerous. And, you know, I sometimes think about those things as I've said earlier. So um, I, try, I try to make the images as beautiful as possible in terms of color. Um, and I, you know, and also that they will have a message. Um, uh, next image. Uh, this one is called the great, it's a, it's a kind of um, a satire. It's on, it's called the greatest minstrel show. It's about the Jim Crow period. It's about like how, you know, uh, we were like entertainers for people or we were just basically made fun of or put in impossible situations, um, uh, you know. And, and so this piece is also, a canvas that has been cut out uh, in parts and, and sort of refabricated onto a wood panel. Uh, next image. This is called The Lovers. This is my moving towards the Afro, more into the future. Um, it's, uh, some people have said it reminds them of like the sort of Viennese period with, you know, Kakashka and Klimp and, uh, but I uh, was not thinking of them at all. I actually thought that uh, it's on a, um, it's a very big painting on Masonite. Um, and next image, I, that might be the last actually. Oh no, okay, so this is a, this is a triple image. It's three paintings that all speak to each other, but they were all made separately. So they were on three wood panels. I think they're like 20, 48 inches tall by 24 inches wide. Um, I was in another solo show I had earlier in the year and they like were all on the same wall together. And I actually would love if someone one day actually gets all three of them. By the way, most of my art, I never think about selling. The only thing is I have another job for that, but I um, mostly it's about sending out it's about an exploration of my own self, my history, my thoughts, where I'm going. And if I'm lucky, every once in a while, someone will end up with one. Uh, next image. Oh, this one is untitled. Um, but what it represents is three figures that are, I, at once I had a title for it um, and it was called For Sale. And um, it's just that, you know, uh, at best black bodies are for sale. You know, it's like, we're kind of like in that range of buying and trading at times. And so that's where the thought came from. I'll leave it at that. Next image. Um, this one is part of my moving into the future. It's a portrait. It is, uh, someone actually has it now, um, but I always found the image really compelling and it's a really mixed media piece. It's a oil painting under uh, with um, sort of, it's not really glitter, it's this other sort of found particles. And uh, it's, a, it's adhered to the painting and then there's a resin coating on top. So uh, next image, and this is called Departure. This is in the current show too. It's about a woman who is finally leaving her world of servitude and she's 
happy. She's on her way to something better. Uh, it's a mixed media piece on wood. I work on a lot on wood panels. I find um, I used to work a lot in canvas and now I'm like sort of loving wood panels. It, re it actually re refers back to my first love was when I went to Europe to see the great masters and I was always attracted to the ones on panels for some reason. So I'm now able to kind of do that myself. Okay, uh, next image. This was called Bliss and uh, In Search of Bliss. And it's another meditative piece. It probably could be a companion to the, uh, the other one uh, on the shoulders. I sometimes think in series, they were made around the same time, maybe one right after the other. It is collage, it's paint, it's, it's uh, you know, it's canvas and paper are all in there, plus paint markers. I do really like mixing up things. I guess you can tell that. Um, and next, <laughs> that, that might be it. That was so, I took so many notes, Mikhail, at what you said too about like no selling, like you're not as interested in selling. It's no. so much about exploration for you. When we get to the chat, I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Um, it was so beautiful. Really beautiful. Um, and Thank up next you. we have Lori Wasselchuk. Um, and we'll put her on screen. And take it away, Lori. Oh, you're on mute. I think that's the most said phrase. You know, I love that even two years into Zoom, we, we still, I, I did it today on a call too. We, yeah. You can still accidentally be on mute. <laughs> I just, I'm still trying to digest uh, Mikkel and Chen Lin's work. Um, I'm, I'm stunned and so humbled. And I just want to send my appreciation um, to you both. And I can't wait to see Ron's presentation and yours, Conrad's. Um, my work, I've been a documentary photographer for too many years. Um, and I, my core question, I think, is I want to, I want to show what community can look like. Where, how does community make us our best um, at what, who we are and and our best at what we can do together. Um, I worked in, I've lived in many cities. Um, so my work is definitely urban. I've lived in Minneapolis, in New Orleans, in Baton Rouge, um, in Johannesburg and now Philadelphia. And all, those, all the places that I've lived, I've focused on how people gather. In Philadelphia, I've been working on a project called Them That Do, which documents the work of block captains in Philadelphia. I've um, been completely charmed and impressed by the um, the fortitude, the determination, the sacrifice, and the um, innovation that Black captains make when they are trying to um, work to better their their block and then their neighborhood and beyond. Um, and so with them that do, I made portraits of block captains doing what they do, like Maureen, she tends to Cedar Park with um, the park tenders. It's all volunteer. They organize, they spend a lot of time. But Maureen comes from a place where they were building gar gardens to um, reduce crime. So it's a, it's a lifelong commitment I found when I photograph block captains. And I, and I, and I use photographs and um, writing to tell their stories and to tell to speak about what they do. Um, and so uh, I did that for about two years and I um, photographed uh, uh, about 60 uh, block captains um, around Philadelphia and, and, and just to show the work that they do. Um, and, uh, uh, and I also photographed um, community gardeners, um, and community activists, mutual aid workers. Um, uh, it's the slideshow is sort of uh, delaying. And what I did was I created a blog um, that uh, highlighted each of each of the people that I that I met and told a little bit about their stories, and just to try to generate um, a conversation around the work of block captains. Um, I had moved from to Philadelphia from working in New Orleans for five years after 
hurricane working and living um, in uh, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and I, f I was so hungry to meet people who gathered and to work who worked together and um, because uh, New Orleans had lost so much of its core community leaders um, and and lost a lot of momentum and growth and potential um, because of the storm, among other things. Um, this is, I also made some video um, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a trained videographer. I'm, I'm a homemade kind of person on this, but here's a video that I did collaborating with um, uh, a young man and um, an animation artist. I wear it because, well, that's me. Uh, that's who I am. My goals with the armor is to protect the community with them. That there's a lot of violence going on out here. I think uh, some of these neighbors need a little protection. But I'm, but I'm not wearing my stuff. Feels like a, feels like I'm breaking down. Interacting with others is something I don't normally do. When I'm in my realm, you know, nothing matters, nothing at all. When I'm out there, I'm out there. It's like a whole different station. When I was born, um, well, I was um, premature. The doctors said I wasn't going to be able to make it and do much anything, but look, here I am, proving them wrong. <laughs> <You're so awesome. laughs> Oops, sorry. Let's try to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, the whole project, the Them That Do project is collaborative. And I worked with Black Captains to generate the content. And we also got the Black Captain worked with Black Captains to generate the places where we distributed and, and watched the content and um, at block parties and uh, screenings in different neighborhoods. Um, and so uh, the work, it was not just about documenting their work, but also creating some new work together. Um, another project that I um, helped facilitate was uh, called Window Wishes. And um, six block captains and I in West Philadelphia created installations in storefront windows that were abandoned on 40th Street. They're now, um, uh, you know, um, fully, uh, renovated and and no longer uh, allow regular people to put in uh, artistic ex uh, exhibitions but we worked together for about six months and we um, each created a each block captain created a window installation based on their core mission to their work um, Mary is a person that leads workshops to help people enter um, home ownership. So she teaches people how to get that first home loan and then how to and how to protect that investment and and help it grow. And so she we all worked together to create a, a window installation that um, that's talked about her work and what she values most as a block captain. Um, you can see that it looked great at night. We had a, a window that um, was dedicated to West, uh, the 52nd Street in West Philadelphia and the music and the theaters that were there at one point um, and having it being the most vibrant um, uh, cultural center in Philadelphia. We had a, a block captain that was interested in tr uh, tree trimming and um, pruning and helping grow trees. Lisa made her installation using uh, making beautiful objects out of trash. Um, Lisa Barkley is also a block captain and, and um, is an incredible human being and, and community giver and leader and artist. Um, 
and Carol, she made these wonderful banners along with her own um, storytelling uh, window about her neighborhood. I've also been photographing block parties. Um, of course, block captains have a big role in block parties often, but it's not the only thing that goes on there. I think block parties are a very organic space and I just am so proud when people take over their, their streets and, um, and repurpose something that is not as friendly for people um, when, they're, when they're not closed off on either end. Um, so I've been photographing block parties since probably 2013 and have um, a wonderful, I think, archive um, of uh, moments and people. And um, I think I love the life of Philadelphia. I love its, I love the culture of the streets. I love its traditions, its annual um, gathering. Um, I love the speaker uh, installations. <laughs> um, and so I've just been interested in um, seeing people in joy and at their, at, at their, the point where they have invited their loved ones. Um, and rain or shine, they make something work out of a, a block party. Um, of course, the kids were the only ones on the street, but the parents definitely kept that jumping castle going. Um, and also just how much people give to one another. You know, they show up as um, the entertainers for the children or the, um, you know, the opportunities, you know, the, the block parties also create these great, um, wonderful opportunities for people that are innovative and have something to share. Um, and, you know, the block parties, they happen in every single space in the city. And I think it's something so valuable that I want to, um, I want to be able to share <laughs> people's creative uh, energies um, around these parties and how important it is for um, generations to, to have this special event every year. I think it's, um, it, it, everybody has stories, I feel like in Philadelphia about their block parties, whether you're, they're young or old, it's, it's, it's definitely a highlight for every summer. Um, and the block captains, you know, they put a lot of work into it. Um, and it pays off, you know, it, it creates memories, it um, builds uh, uh, friendships. Um, and sometimes there are neighbors that only see each other once a year at their block parties. Um, I think I'm gonna try to get to the end. As you can see, I have a deep archive of um, people, for, people gathering for their summer block parties. I think I'm almost to the end. So the next project that I'm working on, I, um, I got a Velocity Fund grant to work with um, uh, community leaders at the Concessing Library and the Cobbs Creek Library. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did with the Window Wishes project. Um, I'm going to um, bring in artists and we're gonna talk about mutual aid, what kind of mutual aid is happening in their neighborhood and the city. And we're gonna create a pop-up exhibition. Um, oh wait, one more. I think there's one more. Um, a pop-up exhibition for the libraries and also a free zine um, uh, that um, we're going to distribute in libraries. And that is to come in August and September. So you and me, make me think like with COVID, the last two years, how few block parties there's been. I'm, yeah. I grew up in Philly. I grew up with block parties. Like they are such an important thing that build community and pull people together. It makes me sad that they think they haven't been happening, but maybe sooner than later, they'll be back. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was great. Laura, that was amazing. <clears throat> that was amazing. I don't want to jump ahead. I have so many good questions from now seeing three artists. I think if, if there's one problem with tonight, it's that Pam curated too many excellent artists and we're, we're going to be short on time. But Lori, thank you so much. Pleasure. Ron, um, you're up. And we're just going to get some of the tech stuff ready. There you are. Hello. And Ron, make sure you unmute yourself there if you can. There you go. All right. I can hear you. Can you can you uh, see your slideshow? Yes. All right. You're on. OK. I'm going to join a meeting on the slide. Wait a minute, let me take this out. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, my name is uh, Ron Washington. I am pretty much an urban painter. I uh, was born and raised in Philadelphia. I'm pretty much an oil painter. I consider myself a social realist. Majority of my paintings deal with people interacting with other people, whether it be Caucasian, white, Chinese, or Korean. It doesn't really matter. My work, I kind of consider it to be universal. Although I grew up in an urban area, I try to expand my horizons in terms of the narratives of my paintings. This particular painting that you're looking at is a woman in a church setting and she's uh, praying. Uh, service is in session and the painting above her is symbolic of peace. And the world we live in now is a turbulent world, it's a turbulent time. And many times my painting tried to offset the turbulence in the world to bring a measure of hope and, and hope and aspiration. So this woman got her hands up and she's meditating with her eyes closed, praying to God that things would be a little bit better. Next. There's another painting of a church scene. I've done several uh, paintings of church scenes. Uh, in this particular painting, uh, we have a couple, a married couple. Uh, they're in the uh, sanctuary of a church building. Uh, the woman is also meditating and she has a prayer on uh, the father or the husband as well on the right-hand side of the composition is also meditating. Uh, I'm, I, I, am, I am pretty much a Pentecostal. Uh, I, I, I go to church like maybe three times a week when church before COVID. And I am a minister at my church at Rosa Sharon in North Philadelphia. And so I'm very familiar with the church scene. And every now and then I, I see certain things in the sanctuary doing worship services. And sometimes I wanna put it on canvas to show people that although uh, life may be difficult, there's always hope and that's the symbolic. Uh, image of the cross. Next. This painting is called Halfway Home. It's a small painting I did of a subway scene. I worked in Philadelphia for over 40 years uh, doing various jobs. And I would take Scepter to work, seeing that I worked in Center City for so many years. And I would also run into a, a, a variety of people and uh, from all walks of life, whether old, young, middle age. And uh, so I just captured this image. Uh, on this canvas of this young woman or the middle middle woman is shown in the center of the composition. Then you have a nun right to her right, and you have a common person to the right, and you have a guy with a mask on. This was the beginning of COVID-19 where people had to wear masks. And so I just wanted to do one image to, cap to, to capture uh, this place in history. Because maybe 50 years from now, we can look at this piece and say, oh, this was the year you had to wear a mask. And hopefully this scene will be over soon. Next. This painting is called Neighbors. I was happened to be riding uh, through Germantown section of uh, Philadelphia. And I saw the light shining. I was at a stoplight and I was driving and I had my cell phone and I saw these row homes and I saw the way the light was hitting these row homes. I said, oh, this would be beautiful in a painting that I can do. So I actually shot the image on my cell phone and I came home and made some thumbnail sketches and I added all the people that you see in the lower portion of the composition. I added toys and other elements in the composition uh, to explain neighbors. Our neighbors are different ages, different sizes, uh, different colors. And also uh, uh, growing up in an urban neighborhood, I believe Lori was speaking in regards to black parties. And I'm very familiar with black parties because when I grew up in North Philadelphia, we would have black parties every year. And it was a good time for people to uh, intermingle with one another, communicate with one another and uh, catch up with what each other is doing, the children are doing and also be an inspiration to people from other areas in the neighborhood who would come and dance and, and eat a hot dog and maybe mingle. And so this painting I kind of like, it's one of my favorite paintings I did last year called Neighbors. Next, this painting is called uh, Fully Loaded. Is a woman uh, in the left-hand side of the composition. Uh, she's an elderly woman and it's symbolic of how when you're old, you experience a lot of experiences and you carry a lot of weights, sometimes a lot of anxieties. And the neighborhood that I painted in is an urban area and I have different people with different walks of life again. And then in the far end of the painting, you see a waste a dump truck, which is symbolic that everything in life really uh, is really vain and vanity. You know, once we leave this world, everything that we do and accomplish is gonna remain here and we can't take nothing with us. So it's a value in being able to uh, carry the load, but also uh, recognize that there is a strength in adversity. Next, this painting is called Corner Boys. Uh, and throughout the uh, city of Philadelphia and throughout other urban cities, 
a lot of times we have a lot of young uh, teenagers and young men gathered together on the corners, sometimes to sing, sometimes to, to talk about sports, sometimes to talk about uh, activities just going on in the neighborhood. And this painting, it was a night scene that I wanted to do because it's been a while since I did a night painting. So I wanted to do something a little different. So I've used the urban setting and the woman on the right hand side is a Muslim who's coming home from the mosque and she has her bag. And one wonders what is on her mind because a lot of times when you see a group of uh, men together, the first thing uh, through a person's mind, through a woman's mind who's single is that what's gonna happen? Are they gonna rob me? Or you know, what's gonna happen if I walk past these guys that's on the corner? When essence is this woman is a picture of strength uh, a, a picture of a hope and a, a picture of what our society is facing today where we have a lot of single women uh, with not a lot of uh, a lot of support. Next. And this painting is dear to me, it's called um, Court in Session. Uh, before I really got into my art seriously, I was very much into basketball. I played a lot of basketball leagues. I played in high school and my teacher gave me an ultimatum when I was in high school. He said, Ron, if you want to get a college scholarship, you have to put basketball aside and focus on your art. So this painting uh, took me back to when I was playing basketball like every day, sometimes three hours a day. It was like a god to me. And this image took me back where we have a lot of guys that go to urban playgrounds and schoolyards and we play basketball four or five hours. That was back in the 70s and the 80s. Of course, now I'm too old to play, but I reminisced about the times that I shared uh, developing relationships with other fellows that I played basketball with. And I also like how I just opposed the figures because most of my paintings, I deal with um, shapes, forms, colors with the intent of producing uh, instant gut response. I want the viewers to look at my work and to be able to have a gut response of the work, whether it will trigger off or an experience that they experienced or something that they are experiencing. And basically my art is basically uh, evocative and representational. Next. And this painting uh, is called No Justice, No Peace. Uh, this piece was commissioned uh, by the gallery that sponsors me, uh, Moody Jones. What happened was in May of 25th, uh, last, well, I believe it was last year, George Floyd was uh, killed. It was a lynching and it triggered an uprising in the streets amid a pandemic. So we was going through a pandemic as well as a lynching. And it brought a lot of systemic racism in America and throughout all the cities in America. And everybody came together to boycott what was going on in our world. And I was asked, by my gallery director to uh, do a painting on how I felt about this incident with George Floyd. I had like two weeks to do the painting because he had a, a, a quick, a small gallery exhibit called No Justice, No Peace. And so I came up with the ideal. I looked at various uh, magazines. I looked at different compositions uh, by way of thumbnail sketches. I had like different figures I took from different images and I made a composite. And this was my final image. It came up to be a very powerful image. And of course the painting sold and not long after it was shown. I was uh, asked to paint about my emotions. And uh, most of my paintings are emotion, emotionally based. You know, like uh, I'll be Mikhail said, most of my paintings are like a, a exploration for me also. But I do like to sell, of course. Uh, <laughs> in this piece, I just painted not just uh, Blacks, but other minorities as well, because we are facing a worldwide epidemic concerning systemic racism. And I think it's time for the whole world to come together in unison and uh, bring about equality among all races and all people. And this will make our world a better place. That should be my final slide. Thank you. Ron, thank you. That was amazing. Again, I just, I have to hold myself back from commenting too much, so. I love the hope in your work. Yeah, yeah. I love that you want to sell. So any of the people <laughs> no, watching me no. advise so. There you go. <laughs> right. And is it, are we on to me? We're on to you. Okay, I'll try to keep it short so that we can have as much time for the conversation as possible. Um, and I can talk really fast. I'm gay and Italian, so there you go. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get into it. So my name is Conrad Benner um, and I run a blog here in Philadelphia called Streets Department. It highlights and celebrates art on the streets of Philadelphia. Um, what does that mean? Uh, that's a great question. And that's what we'll explore for two seconds. So um, generally speaking, when we're talking about art in the public space, we have two broad categories, um, commissioned and non-commissioned. Those are the terms I like to use or other terms that could be used. On the commission side, there's public art, of course, things like Simone's Lee, uh, Simone Lee's new sculpture in West Philly. This is 34th Street, uh, University of Pennsylvania. It's incredible. It's brand new. If you've not seen it, go take a, you know, a day this spring when the weather's nice and go check it out. Um, so public art, uh, generally speaking, is 3D sculpture. That's how I think the broadest term could be used. Um, and then public art 
can also be murals. <laughs> um, but murals generally are murals. It's that thing where, uh, a, what is it? A square is always a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't always a square. I think that's it. A mural is always public art, but a public art isn't a mural. Um, so on the commission side, again, we have 3D public artworks and sort of 2D murals. Um, murals can be paint on walls. Oftentimes, you, usually it's paint on walls. It can also be mosaic. In Philadelphia, there's artists like Isaiah Zagar and Magic Gardens who do 3D mosaic work made with sort of like broken dishes and tiles. But most of the murals in Philly, someone on this call said, guessed at the number. It's closer to 4,000, the number of murals wow. we have in the city. That's in large part to the fact that we have the nation's largest and longest running mural arts program with Mural Arts Philadelphia, which started as the Anti-Graffiti Network mm -hmm. and is now the Mural Arts Program. It's been running for 37 years. Um, we also have the Percent for Art program. We're the first um, municipal government in the entire world to have a Percent for Art tax incentive that encourages and requires certain building permits to, uh, require, to create public art outside of their buildings. Um, so that's why we have things like monuments here. And I count architecture as public art too, right? And mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of cool. Yeah. On the non-commission side, uh, we have two general categories, graffiti, which is where it kind of all started. Modern day graffiti started about five to 10 years after the invention of the spray can, um, <laughs> which makes sense because you want to do something quick and kind of get out of there. Yep. Um, but it's moved, it's morphed into, I mean, it's been around for so many decades now into this really cool modern art movement. I mean, there are people in the arts who consider graffiti the most important uh, art movement of, you know, the last couple of generations. Mm -hmm. um, it's seen throughout the world, it's spread like wildfire and it's all over the world now. Most people who do non-commissioned work will do, do so on abandoned buildings, construction materials, or sometimes infrastructure like this, you know, oftentimes around train uh, lines, there's a lot of graffiti. Um, generally speaking, places that too many people don't mind too much and that don't cause too much damage. Um, graffiti, of course, gave birth to street art, which is really what the focus of my blog is. So there's all different kinds of street art from we paste to installations like this. This is a comedic street artist. His name is Kid Hazo, and his whole goal, his entire goal with his artwork is to make people smile. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, one of the canvases for street art and for graffiti are these um, abandoned buildings or construction materials. This is what I mean when I say construction materials. This is a restaurant that was un undergoing some uh, reconstruction. So for a few months, these panels were up and street artists will go wild on those panels. Mm. And I love it because it means there's lots of cool new art out there and space for people to experiment with stuff. So Kid Hazo, the, com the comedian he is, put up this little sign. It says, uh, these aren't real cameras, have fun, you know, mocking <laughs> sort of the surveillance of street artists. Another form of street art is yarn bombing. This is something that's really been popular the last 10 years or so. This is an artist in Philly who learned crochet herself and started doing these fun, playful installations around the city. This is about six feet tall by about six feet wide. It's huge. And this installation got so popular on TikTok, it got a million views and got her on the Today Show. So listen, kids, if you're artists out there, just keep going. You never know what's going to pop. This is an artist, um, NDA, who did 3D installations. I call this street art because they were temporary and non-commissioned. Um, these are foam forms, so they're really light. He put them up in different parks over the course of the day. We have folks like Joe Borschow. This is a project that he uh, participates in called Ad Takeovers. So there is this program in this, uh, or there's a man who calls himself, yeah, we got keys for that, where you can request bus shelter keys, get those keys and remove the ads that are in there and replace it with art. Now, this is a bit of social commentary. You'll see this a lot with uh, street art. Um, Joe was making a commentary on the fact that, um, oh, I'm just, I'm forgetting the name of that. What is this, this space up here? Uh, Dilworth Plaza? No, right at Broad and Chestnut, there is a space where uh, the Philadelphia Club, I think, or something, where they, there's events. Union and League. Union League. Oh, there we go. Yeah. That's why I shouldn't, have, I should have had a copy of the union league, but um, this was during the Trump administration and he was making a commentary on sort of how that space was often used for Republican fundraisers and um, he wasn't a fan of that. Uh, this is an, an example of a wheat paste. This is an incredible artist here in Philadelphia named Simone Salib. Um, this was a commentary she was making about sort of beauty standards in this country. Mm -hmm. And it can also be funny. This is gritty. It, this was Christmas. This is an artist named Marissa Velasquez Rivas. She's great. Um, and stickers, Philadelphia has a huge sticker culture. Um, hmm. This is Bob Will Rain. He's been doing stickers for 
about as long as any of us have lived. Um, he is really interesting and stickers have a lot in common with like advertising. A lot of sticker artists want to get their stickers everywhere and be seen and kind of get a name for themselves. Mm. Um, uh, another sticker artist, Underwater Pirate. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about documenting the uncommissioned mm -hmm. side of art in the public space. The difference between commissioned and non-commissioned, generally speaking, is that with commissioned work, you have a much longer process. Usually there's a community process. Usually um, there's a responsibility on the, on the part of the artist and the fundraiser mm -hmm. to make sure that the artwork is being created that is permanent or semi-permanent, has some relation to the neighborhood or the community, or at the very least it has input or approval. Where with street artists, you know, um, an artist can feel a certain way one day, maybe feel inspired by something that happened that weekend, create an artwork. And this artwork was up for a couple of days, you know. Um, so that's the core of my work. Uh, I moved, I can talk very quickly about, um, in the last few years, I've quit my full-time job in marketing to pursue streets department full-time. And that's allowed me to work on a number of different projects, including curatorial projects. This is one of the first uh, public art projects I ever worked on that I curated and helped lead. It was a project to call attention to the youth homelessness in Philadelphia, mm. which is a solvable problem. This is a problem that can be solved with funding. Um, you know, I don't believe that homelessness should exist. I think we, have, we live in a country that has a big enough heart and certainly enough money to not allow for homelessness. And so what this installation was doing was working with Covenant House PA. If you're listening and you've never heard of them, go check them out, you know, donate your time, donate your money if you can. They offer beds and housing um, to youth in, here in Philadelphia. So the what we have here is an installation that's meant to bring up the number 517, 546. That was the number of kids, youth, they had to turn away that year, hmm. 2016. Um, again, this is just a funding issue. Uh, after that, I've worked on a lot of issues around voting rights and voting, getting people excited about voting. Uh, in 2020, I worked with a number of artists and we did these installations at Love Park. We built these walls and built these murals. And it was all about asking these artists, some of whom were a bit apathetic, even in 2020, why they vote, why it's important to vote. And they all came up with different reasons. Um, this installation was temporary. It was just the month of October when uh, the election was happening. Mm -hmm. And I think we got some really cool art from it. You know, we live in this interesting time where, you know, people can use their social media to advertise various things, you know, brands do it, right? You'll see a Nike ad when you're on Instagram, or you'll see an ad when you listen to a podcast. So you can use your social media platforms to promote things that you want to see out there, like more civic engagement or better voting. Um, I have a few like that, but I can't reach. Oh, I have to undo the. Uh, I do have full screen. I can't like click up here. It's so funny. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, really quickly, we also did murals around COVID-19. We did hand washing mm -hmm. stations. That's an example of that. Um, most recently, I worked with a number of artists. We did installations at an uh, unused store warehouse or storefronts here in Philadelphia. We worked with artists and we called attention to a number of black, brown, queer, and Asian owned businesses here in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and most recently, as I mentioned at the top, this is the end. Uh, I work with WHRLI now, and I talk about public art and public space issues, including the fact that we don't have a lot of public restrooms. And no. I think that was something that became very evident to folks during the pandemic when you couldn't go use a coffee shop's bathroom. So, you know, where are our public bathrooms is something I explored. Why are most of our monuments in the city monuments to white men? Um, mm -hmm. That's a topic that I think needs more discussion. And things like, why are we building our public spaces to be less engaging and frankly, anti-people, anti-homeless? Mm -hmm. um, so those are sort of the topics I'm discussing now with my work at WHOI, but um, thank you for listening. Shall we move on to the questions? We should, we should. We have just a reminder to people, you can put questions uh, in that Q&A section. We have, a, we have one question so far from somebody and more coming, I hope. I did wanna ask a question and all the artists, yeah, you could uh, turn your, uh, your video on so we can have a conversation together with the time we have remaining. Is it all right if I jump in with a question? Yeah, I feel like a newscaster, yes. Um, I know, it's kind of fun. I heard uh, from all of the artists, including Conrad, um, I, uh, Chen Lin, you said uh, at one point, art can be fun and easy. Uh, Mikhail, you talked about that image of you in Brooklyn, maybe at a party, you said it was just something fun. Uh, Lori, you said you were trying to capture enjoyment. 
uh, that comes with block parties. Ron, I heard you say that you were trying to capture sort of hope and if, um, aspiration at, at certain points as well. Um, you said that Ron's work was was uplifting when you were seeing it. And, yeah. and, and your stuff was, I mean, that's kind of funny to put a sign up that says these cameras aren't real, have fun. Yeah. So I guess I would love to hear about that for anybody that wants to talk about that. We don't, I think people think about artists and they think about very serious people and there are very serious things that you all are doing with your artwork, but you also all were trying to do something. We don't hear the word fun, I think a lot in public life at the moment. So anyone want to take that on? How can art be fun? Why do you, what, 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 what resonates you know, for you with art, that? Art is so scary to so many people. That's why I love street art and muralism. It seems like, yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah. How do you, is part of thinking about art being fun, something, a way to make it more accessible to folks, um, the topics and the forms you're choosing? No, no, does anyone, oh, oh, Ron, you're on mute. I was like, I see Mal's moving. Okay. With me personally, the actual process is uh, fun uh, being the creator of the works itself and to be able to have the viewers uh, have a subjection attitude towards the image, to me will bring about hope and life and fun. I mean, it's all about life and it's about finding the pleasantries of life and also showing the different portals that life offers. If you notice in most of my work, I have different venues, uh, basketball courts, uh, churches, subway scenes, neighborhoods, because this all encompasses life itself. And with yeah. me being a Christian and apostolic, I try to have a positive outlook on life itself because I realize that life is short and we have to make good use of our time while we have the opportunity. Yeah. Mikhail, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think um, I like using color. That makes me happy. So the bottom line is, is that even if the piece has like some serious undertones to it, just that sort of pop of color like actually makes me like feel like I'm 10 years old yeah. and I hope the, I hope the viewer feels that way too. You know, if they're looking at this image, they'll see something in the image that might right. make them feel a little bit uplifted. Yeah. Mikhail, you said something interesting too while you were talking. You talked about how um, everyone's moving so fast, even during COVID maybe. Yeah, we're on a million Zoom calls a day. We're, you know, mm -hmm. being productive, this, that, and the other thing. You said everyone's moving so fast. Um, no one is sort of slowing down to really understand and investigate and explore what life is. So I'm curious, what, how would you respond to that? What is life and why? Okay, so the slowest period was actually that first month of lockdown during yep. COVID. Yeah. And I remember I actually only had three things to do within a day. It was probably go to my studio, make some work, uh, go for a walk, um, and like think a lot. Um, you know, like just read books that I put, you know, start and never finished or because constantly I realize I'm moving from one thing to the next and sometimes not even taking a breath. You know, I, you know, one of the things with uh, meditation is about being still and sort of like just absorbing your environment and, and everything around you. And nature is a good way. You can take a walk and you're in nature and, and you don't have like a lot of distractions. But I think, yeah, once, once that passed, everyone got back to like this sort of hurried pace. And now it's like a feeling of like, I think, catching up because mm. for that one little short period of time, you know, things got, you know, people felt like things were lagging. So now yeah. they've got to go into like overkill with it to catch up. So. Yeah. We have a great question from someone in the chat. Um, and I think it's for everyone. So maybe we can go around and start with Chen Lin, um, Lori, Ron, and then Mikkel. And the question is, um, do you as an artist feel that you have a responsibility to yourself, to your friends, to your community, to your family, et cetera? when it comes to your art, who is the responsibility to when you're creating? Is it to yourself? Is it to your community? Mm. Is there an order of operations when it comes to that? Um, I think that's an interesting question, Chen Lin. Okay, so I can answer this question. So 
uh, technically I make two different kind of you know material for my arts. One is my studio practice, so I make an oil painting and then like mixed medium and just show some of the social issues and the political issue I concern. For public mural project, mostly I concerned. I what I can you know, one is more pay attention is you know, the work I create for the community for the people it represent. So for example, it's like some of the mural I design for the like a business, I need to read the, the story, read their background, and to read what kind of culture they can be represent. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not simply design a mural to decorate, you know, not, not de decorate or the beautify uh, environment. Of course, it's necessary, but it's not all of it. So I need to tell story, let people to recognize, okay, each, each you know, venue have their own story. When I do my art, so, so some of my student work, I do think about a lot of, you know, problems and, and questions. So example, I came from, I come from China. And then when I came there, uh, uh, arrived in a, a Philadelphia of 2014, at that time, China had very serious air pollution problem. So I make a series of painting, painting official masks. And then I use a human skin texture to, you know, to put it on top of the facial mask and do as my work. And then, in, who knows, you know, to, since 2020, 2020, the whole world just wear facial mask. Mm. When the first time you show this piece of work, the people just, just, they're just very surprised. Okay, in China, people wear facial mask every day? They say, yes, they cannot believe. Now, everyone has to believe, you know, yeah. this is the situation. But, you know, for the community work, especially after the pandemic, okay, since the start from 2021, this kind of the people uh, feel more comfortable to go outside have activity. So Chinatown can uh, contact me, just let me to design some uh, project and make the community member can be enjoy, can be feel more comfortable to gather together to, you know, people to talk, to share. So I think this, at this time, mural can be, should be an easier, you know, relaxed, you know, method for them to express some of their, you know, stress, uh, so I designed the mural in very colorful. I agree, Kelly said, and colors really make people feel happy and then make the theme simple, easier to understand. And the reason why I make a mirror on the ground because in China we have the term said, just like, you know, walking in, into a picture. So people really enjoy making a, a mirror on the ground and they can walk on top every day. It's unlike on the wall, on the wall, it's nice, beautiful, I like it. But really on the ground, you can walk in, you can just really, you know, participate. So, and then when we make this mural, I invite, you know, the participant from like I said, 76 years old grandma to the five years old, you know, grandson, granddaughter to, they can work together and then they enjoy. So that's a really, I understand how the, my art, okay, my art responsible to myself, to the, my family, other than to the community. Thank you. I love the idea of like literally seeing yourself in the art, like with that ground mural. You know, yeah. I imagine all the drone photographers who saw, who literally saw themselves in the art by putting the camera up there. Lori, what about you? Is there a sense of responsibility you have to yourself, to you know, the community, to your neighbors when you're creating your art? I mean, I guess either way, it's part. It's got to. It has to energize you in a way, right? Absolutely. Um, I I am a storyteller. I'm a visual storyteller, and so um, I'm in a. I feel my happiest when I'm learning from other people. And so that's how I, um, that's my sustenance, that's my creativity. But I also politically and socially and um, philosophically believe that we are at our best through each other. I'm a strong student. I'm a student of Desmond Tutu and his philosophy of Ubuntu and where I only, I am only because you are. And that has always filled my, my my work and how and why I do what I do I I I learn so much from other people's examples of how they create community and spend time together and I think that is the visual poetry that feeds my practice. Mm -hmm. Ron, I'd love to hear from you about this too. Yes, I feel as an artist, we do have a responsibility to ourselves as well as the community and also as well to the viewing uh, crowds that view our work. I think first and foremost, we have to be honest with ourselves and we have an inner vision of uh, whether we express it through mixed media, uh, you know, street painting or oil painting, watercolor, or whatever medium we choose to select as an artist, we have, must be honest, number one. And when the viewers see our outcome or see our final rendition of what we envision within ourselves, 
they can interpret whether we're uh, just uh, prostituting our skills or whether we're trying to convey a message that mm. will bring about hope again to our, to our generation and to our world. And like I said, we're leaving the legacy behind. So we must be honest, number one, and we do have a responsibility to do our very best when we present it to the community and be honest about every stroke, every color, every form, and every ideal. If we do that, we'll be successful. That's a fascinating concept about being honest in your artwork. I love that, Ron. That'd be great. Thank Mikhail, you. do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I want to add to what Ron said because I was just going to say it's about living in the truth. Um, at different points in my through the years of my art practice, like there were periods of time where I did want to do what was, I thought was the trend of the moment. And most of the time, mm -hmm. the work fell short of what my capabilities were because I was actually in fact imitating someone else, not myself. Right. Um, and I also found that people didn't respond. I mean, you might get one or two, they're responding to maybe you know, your technical skills, but they're not responding to the piece. And so then I realized when I let go of all of that, just decided that I'm just gonna be me. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. More people seem to like my work hmm. when I'm just being myself. Yes, so. that's great. Did you wanna comment on that? Um, no, you heard enough from me. There's, um, a, there's a great question here. Can I bring it up? Sure. Okay. And it's kind of to you, but it's also to all the artists here. So um, one of the people attending tonight, I guess, had the pleasure of meeting you before and said, Conrad, about five years ago, you led some of our friends select uh, students on a tour of political street art in Fishtown. In just those five years, it seems political discourse has changed in many ways. And I'm curious yeah, if any of the panelists have felt pressure internal uh, personal desires or external expectations to produce more political art or explain their work in more political language. So mm. I, I don't know if everyone needs to comment on that, but does anyone want to take that question up about how <laughs> sort of the political tensions that I referenced in my introduction maybe inform your art in any ways? And to back up with this commenter saying too, you know, I've been running this street art blog for 10, 11 years now. And there was around 2016, a turn where I saw artists who had never done political street art before start to do political mm -hmm. street art. And we had artists like, there's an artist named Hysterical Men who was completely inspired by the Brett Kavanaugh hearings to start making artwork in the public space. Um, so I've certainly seen that in the street art world, mm -hmm. um, more political street art. Look, street art has always been political. It's right. a political statement to say, I am going to create something in the public space without your without your permission. So right. it's political to say, you know, right. from the beginning. But um, I definitely think we're in an uptick, certainly, um, with people, you know, I think people want to see themselves reflected in the public space. I think people want to see their values and hopes and dreams and mm -hmm. aspirations reflected in the public space. And I think we have great organizations, mural arts and otherwise, that help do that with communities and with painters and artists in the city, a couple in this panel. Um, but you, they can't act immediately. So when you see a, a bananas tweet from a person or you know, you, you feel a certain way or a movement happens, you wanna see artwork a little more quickly that responds to the moment that reflects all that. So yeah, I wonder if have any of you had that experience? It seems like all of you are working on sort of longer range, bigger issues and a couple of you are working in, directly into history. Lori, you're raising your hand. I, I became a performance artist when Trump was elected, so <laughs> I. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I was trying not to say his name. I tried so hard not to. Get hard, but okay, yeah. So, so I did a four. I began a four-year journey um, where I it was a daily practice where I wore a borrowed or um, gifted or homemade T-shirt um, that reflected the kind of society that I was was wishing for and working towards it was it was a response it wasn't angry it was mostly hopeful and it was rooted in research so every morning I did my research on what kind of thing I wanted to express on my body and then I made that shirt and I wore it during the day I posted it so uh, the language went outwards um, and into the community, and I did it every day of Trump's presidency. Wow. Um, 
Lori, and, I, I know we can all go search you after this and go find this project, but can you give us some examples of the language? Uh, it was all, I'm not a, I'm not a I don't know, but... okay, it was all, um, it was really, I relied a lot on our thinkers and our writers and our artists. Mm. And I was, you know, and, and, um, and our activists and our historians. And, you know, it was all the things that were generating conversations. It was responsive mm -hmm. um, when they started to separate families. It was, it was you know, I wore a, a hand-drawn shirt at my, my niece's wedding in which I was the photographer that was absolutely crying from fa about family separations. So mm -hmm. it was really about not having to feel like I had to say something every day because I was angry or I was upset or I was traumatized or I was, I was wishing for something other than what we were experiencing. It was about wearing it and people could read it and react or they could not. And it was, it was just, and I was silent um, in the wearing. Um, and it felt, it felt very much, it, I was very rooted in the everyday of, and that seems kind of crazy now, every single day of Trump's presidency, but I was rooted in what was happening in our lives and that during those times. Great. It was crazy. I'm now a photographer. <laughs> well, and, and, <laughs> and Trump or no Trump, Mikkel and Ron, you both had paintings that depicted I, as you both described, like groups of young black kids on the street being like, why is this political, right? Why is it a political statement to do artwork like this? Why, why, are, why is it? Oh yeah, go ahead. Mikhail, did you raise, oh, it looked like you were Yes, right. yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so my realization came out of the news. I mean, well, it always comes out. Okay, so you we can choose to express things either uh, through writing or, you know, some people it's images, some, you know, there's different ways to express yourself. So I have been making paintings based on the racial elements of like our society for a while, but I, I work in a bubble, you know, like I go to my studio, I just make the work. But then what I was doing when I became so outraged with like the the round, you know, Black Lives Matter and the George, you know, Floyd and all of these other murders that were going on. It started again because I was actually in L.A. Uh, living in Los Angeles when um, Rodney King happened. Mm -hmm. And back then I was an optimistic younger painter that just wanted to get in galleries and to show. And I chose at that time not to make too much art that had any sort of basis on uh, reality. Um, but as I've matured, I don't have a lot of ways to express myself. I can write a little bit, but you know, painting is like my first medium. So as I saw this sort of coming back again, I mean, it never really left. It just rears, you know, you'll hear a, a bunch of stories and then it sort of fades. And then, uh, and then everyone gets sort of a little bit like comfortable that maybe it's, you know, it's like when Obama came along, we were happy for a moment that it looked like <laughs> things were like pairing, you know, getting better. And then all of a sudden, right after that, here comes the next wave. And so anyway, all said and done, um, I just felt just compelled to start to deal with this fact of identity and perception and this idea that of, of misperception, uh, you know, like, and so that's my political edge. It's like, how, I mean, how can people walk, the, how can people move forward with all of these things? There was history that I never even knew about because I wasn't taught in school. And I find out now that we have the internet, it's both good and bad because it actually has information that I would have like, that was hidden. It was always there. It just wasn't in any textbook that I was given. So I'm finding out these things. And one of the realizations, and not to drag on forever with this, but one of the realizations was I'm watching a film on Netflix and it was around the time of the pandemic or right before. And I'm questioning, I'm thinking because, you know, sometimes like films take liberties. So I'm like questioning, like, did that really exist? This was the Oklahoma burnings of, mm -hmm. you know, like, like I never even actually was taught that in school. So I'm now thinking like, 
this particular director incorporated this in there and it's maybe a made up situation until of course I Googled it. And then I realized, oh my gosh, that ha it happened there. That happened, that was real. And then there was another one in North Carolina and there was like, another, you know, like you learn all of these things. So it, at this age in my life, I'm realizing that I don't even really know what's real and what isn't at times because <laughs> there's been all of these things that have been like sort of changed. So that's been my exploration in the work. I had to put it in the work as much as I, I was compelled to put elements of it in the work because it just needs to be addressed. So. I think we could talk all night about what's real and what's not real. I love that. It's really true. It's really true. Um, we're, we're over our time. Is there one more? Uh, you know, one, thing we want to I have so many here? questions. I know, so we could go I know, we could go forever. Chen Lin, you, you said when you moved to Philly, you were surprised. You had some thoughts on like the artwork here. I loved, you know, I follow a lot of, or I meet a lot of artists who do street art to make a name for themselves and then end up doing murals and stuff like that, right? Um, so it's interesting you went the restaurant route. But one thing that stuck out to me is you talked about how you were surprised that of the 4,000 plus murals we have in the city, there were only a, about a dozen or so that were to the Asian community. Did that surprise you? And how did you go to, in a relatively short amount of time, you know, pitching restaurants to do murals of them to a 16 foot story mural? That's huge, that's awesome. So yeah, were you surprised by that? The, the absolute lack mm. of representation and then how did you quickly go from restaurant murals to this, this huge opportunity? Okay, so when I first came here, even though I did a lot of mural projects in China, but to, in Philly, uh, in the United States, I'm nobody. So I just need to let people know what I can do. So the easiest strategy is to start to spread out my art. But, you know, to get the public mural project, I know it should go through the you know, application process and the committee, you know, review. And at that time, in the very beginning, my is so poor. I was, I'm not the captain to, to do all of this, but I know here we have the Chinese community or the Asian community. So it's easier for me to assess to them, to show them that well, I have my portfolio and then tell them if you have any idea to show your stories through the murals, I can do it for you. So this is my strategy, started from the small business, the restaurant, and then doing, uh, doing uh, my mural, design my mural for them. And people surprised, okay, this guy, you know, can do the nice mural and then people recommend me to another. So I start to do the murals for the Japanese restaurant to show the Japanese culture, do the Vietnamese restaurant, do the you know, Vietnamese culture. The more I, I, uh, I do my, I done my mural and people start to, re to pay attention to me. So Philadelphia Chinatown, PCDC, Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation, they notice me, they just say, okay, can you do something for us? I say, yes. So then step by step from the restaurant mural to a ground mural and then to the building mural, like, you know, like 15 floor high in the mural. So what I'm working on now, but each mural, I start to let people to know about all the culture, all the meaning it represent, especially like, you know, last year, the, uh, the anti-Asian hate. So people just really angry because, you know, Asians feel really, you know, not, the, not comfortable, not the safe in this in the community sometimes, you know, in certain, area so i said if you want to show you know solve the problem we are not hate them no let people know asian more is a better way so when i create mural i invite not only just the you know asian you know, community i also invite the Hispanic, you know, the mexican you know family i, I invite the you know, black and uh, african uh, american friends to participate so make this as a more meaningful people you know, stay together talk to together not about each other. This is a better way to solve the you know, hate mm -hmm. problem. So this is my strategy. Let people know about me and then let my work to, to be more powerful, to speak more, to solve kind of the sum of the problem I can. I try my best. <laughs> Dude, that, can there be a better way to wrap up? Yeah, that, that, was, that, that, was, that was a great wrap up. up. That was a great wrap up. Can I say <laughs> one thing though? Mikhail, Absolutely. Mikhail, you are part of the Mural Arts 2021 Fellows, right? Yes. So, Anyone listening, there is an application now for the 2020, what year are we in? 2022 
Mural yeah. Arts uh, Black Artist Fellowship. So if you are a Black artist here in Philadelphia and you want, you know, what the opportunities you get with this fellowship are $2,000 of unrestricted funding. You can use it to pay your rent. You can use it for supplies. Yeah. There's no questions asked. And then some, some support that's explained through the application. So just go to muralarts.org right now if you want to learn more about that. The application ends at the end of this month on the 28th, so you don't have a lot of time. This is awesome. such a great talk. Yes, thank you. Thank <laughs> you, Conrad. Thank, thank you, Lori. Thank yes. you, Mikhail, Ron, and thank Chandler. You. This is amazing. <laughs> Michael, thank you. Michael, do you want to close us out? Say any last words? I will love to. Uh, friends, thank you so much for inspiring us all. Mm -hmm. Your creativity just visually uh, wasn't arresting, but your words were equally arresting. And thank you for your passion. And thank you for all that you do to bring us beauty. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank, you. Night. Thank you for Thank having me. It was awesome. Enjoy fake spring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so good.